We, I'd like to uh, welcome Rick McCauley. Uh, he has uh, graciously uh, prepared a presentation for us tonight. A little bit about Rick. Uh, you may have, uh, many of you already know Rick. He doesn't need an, uh, an introduction, but I'll give you a brief one here. Rick's a uh, photographer, design thinker. He's a senior professor of graphic design at Broward College. He's been there for the past 20, uh, 21 years. He has done over 2,500 dives. He was a staff photographer for the Miami Herald for 13 years. And he actually dove to capture the first photos of the Atosha uh, with Mel Fisher, the actual day that it was discovered. How exciting is that? There's Look at that. That's the first coin discovered on the Atosha. Wow. He stuck it in my BC. I didn't even know it. Wow. But I helped him find that. And then we also found a treasure chest right next door. You'll see the picture in a minute. That is amazing. Um, you've also filmed the first space shuttle launch for presidents and the Pope. And Rick, this, is, this will be his 30th book, which he's going to talk about a little bit tonight. His latest being an underwater photography guidebook. And uh, he has a, uh, is it a master of arts? Is that what you have um, from uh, Barry University, Rick? And yes. also a master of uh, MFA, is it a master of fine arts? That's right, yeah. In graphics design from Florida Atlantic University. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rick. He's got a, uh, a, link, a link in the chat here, which everyone can uh, click on if they go into the chat where he's uh, gave us a link. Uh, it's in there several times, but uh, take it away. Rick McCauley, thank you again for- Hey, thanks Chris and everybody. It's fantastic to get a chance to come back and, and speak to all my friends that I've kind of met over the years. It's kind of odd that 30 years ago, I joined the Swaps Club when it used to meet at Calder Racetrack. Um, and then after my marriage ended, I came back to Swaps and had all the same friends and people that have been here even in that long. And uh, just have learned so much from being a member and being surrounded by incredible photographers. Um, yeah, that I you know want to show my work, but I kind of um, a little bit shy about it tonight. It, you, when you're amongst people who do the kind of work you guys do, um, I'm honored to be you know in this position to be able to do this. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight, uh, if you want to download the link that you saw there. Um, uh, hopefully it works. So one or two of you have emailed me saying the link didn't work properly. It's a 176 megabyte file and includes the 100 photographs that are going into the book. I have actually changed a couple of them out. Susan Mendoli and some other people have made some help me with some really good edits. It's 100 photographs from the last seven years of my diving collected together along with the stories that talk about photography and why one photograph is better than the next. It, uh, my talk tonight basically is going to deal with the idea that if we learn to talk about photography with the language of photography, that we can make better photographs by analyzing why one <laughs> is better than another. We all can say, I like this one, I don't like that one. But to be able to root down as to why, that's really the, the focus of what I'm going to present tonight and the focus of the book that I'm going to be producing into a, a Kickstarter project for the first time. So hopefully that works out pretty well. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Okay. And go to my desktop. Let's see if this works properly. Let me know if you can see the PowerPoint presentation right here. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go in and go full screen and start talking, you know, fairly quickly. So I'm going to talk about how to talk about photography, which is uh, one of my favorite things to do. So as uh, Chris mentioned, um, yeah, I've been working 21 years at Broad College. I've taught and created and designed curriculum for um, 10 years of my life at Barry University International Fine Arts College. So I design programs that teach photography, graphic design, uh, 3D animation, et cetera. And then I got offered a job full time at Broward College in 2000 um, to come there and start teaching there and running the program. Um, the program there teaches um, uh, students in two years to get a job. And we have a 90% success rate 
of people getting uh, professional jobs in the industry of graphic design. And then we also have digital photography, UX and UI design, web design, etc. So that's, um, I've got a lot of practice of having, uh, doing these type of presentations, especially in the last year, since we were fully online for all the classes that we've been teaching. <laughs> um, so today, if you want to download those pictures, the cool thing that I, I want to make this interactive and, and talk back and forth um, is that I would like you to go through the little folder that says top 100 photographs and find your favorite picture. And then what I'll do is I'll bring it up on screen um, in the bridge. And you'll just tell me, I'll show you what that looks like. There's the bridge. Um, and then you'll say, oh, I like number one. And that's actually the picture we we're just talking about. This is Mel Fisher when I worked for the Miami Herald. Um, I was called by him uh, Friday night when he found the Atosha wreck. Uh, finally, after 20 some odd years looking for it, the loss of both his son and daughter-in-law and uh, countless struggles with finances and everything else. Uh, today's the day was his big thing and this was the day. Um, I got there at 7 a.m. in the morning. He was still on the bar stool celebrating from all night long. Um, I literally took his drunken butt off the bar stool and dragged him to the boat. And we went out, just he and I. I was the only underwater photographer with him at the moment with my Nikonis and a 15 millimeter lens and a sub C 150 strobe. Um, and uh, we started at the main pile, which was silver bars about 100 feet in length. Um, oh, Nicole's joining us. Thank you. Um, about 100 feet in length. And he directed me towards the front of the boat um, uh, and started to teach me how to fan for, uh, they were pulling up silver bars, 70 pound silver bars, um, each one being lifted to the surface after it had been photographed in place for the archaeological content and the placement of everything. And as they were doing that behind us, he directed me towards the, the front of the ship, which we expected to find something. Um, he starts fanning the waves, uh, the sand, and I did the exact same thing. And then I found the very first coin. It looked like just a, I don't know, if, can you all see this too, or am I not showing? Well, we can't see it because the uh, green screen is uh, killing it. Oh, okay. But that's the, the, the coin I showed you earlier. So I actually found that place. Myself, handed it to him and he started freaking out, getting all excited. Um, and I didn't know he did this, but I had a big horse collar BCD and he popped it in there for me. Um, and two weeks later, when I was cleaning my gear out, should have cleaned my gear earlier, I found it. Of course, as a, a professional at the Miami Herald, I wasn't allowed to accept gifts from anybody, including Mel Fisher giving me the coin that I found on his ship. Uh, but anyway, long story short, I ended up with that. I ended up with this photograph um, where I also was fanning and I call over to him and I said, hey, there's, there's a piece of wood here. And so I uncovered the first piece and then he came over, started freaking out again. I took this photograph as he uncovered the, um, the coins in the chest. So this is the first chest of coins to be found on the Atosha. So um, I've been taking photographs all my life. So I'm gonna go back to this one. And um, here I am at age 17. I was certified in Gainesville, Florida um, by Tom Allen from, uh, you know, Ross Island, uh, from what's that, Mutual Omaha or Mutual Omaha or wherever he did, Tom Allen. Everybody probably knows him from the TV shows, et cetera. He was my instructor, uh, age 14. My, my father came with me to get it uh, certified. And this is a photograph of me at age 17 with all my U.S. divers gear, including what I forgot all about, which is this little J valve that you see hanging off the side, which was basically a reserve that you had to pull down while you were diving. And uh, oddly enough, what we were talking about just now, the springs, um, as a kid, I dove 76 different springs, including diving with the manatees before you couldn't touch them, um, and uh, just made incredible pictures with my Nikonis and all this equipment, which I had no idea what I was going to do, but I wanted to become Jacques Cousteau. So on the right, here I am at age 60 in Palau on the, uh, uh, the, um, the seaplane wreck that's there and uh, making a selfie with my big giant gear. Uh, I'll do the technical thing just to cover the bases on it. Um, Nauticam um, housing, um, uh, a D500 Nikon, uh, 60 millimeter lens for macro, a Tokina 10 to 17 lens for uh, wide angle. 
But I've started actually using a new lens when I was photographing sharks. And I might just want to mention this just in case anybody else finds this true. Um, the fisheye lenses uh, have such distortion when you're photographing large animals. And many times the large animals have quite a distance between you and them. So if you do have clear water, I've started using an 18 to 55 uh, Nikon lens, which is the kit lens that comes with the very inexpensive um, cameras. Um, and that 18 to 55, of course, has a, a little bit of alteration in the wide angle, but it gives me a more rectilinear look and feel to it and gives me a, a shooting distance that's a little bit more appropriate when I'm doing something like um, uh, photographing large animals. So you don't get that giant hammerhead with a giant head that's distorted. And I hate the distortion underwater photography um, in a lot of cases. I want it to be looking like what I saw and not have that corner pin cushion thing going on. Um, so yeah, here's the whole story of my life and published all over the world. And yeah, the Mel Fisher thing is, is a dream come true for any kid, of course. Um, so change the view to standard. Okay, let me try that. Does that help you? Does that help your view? Can you hear me? <laughs> no, you don't want to do that. Now you're in. Uh, oh, okay. Now, now you don't have full screen. Okay. Yeah, Rick, you don't. Each individual person in the upper right hand corner to remove the presenter or the people. If you click on standard view, then you're going to get a bunch of boxes in the upper right hand corner. If you click on the leftmost one, it removes the people. But Rick, you don't necessarily have to do that. Everybody else it has the ability to do that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Yours looks perfect, Rick. So, yep. Okay, great. All right. Doing great. Um, so, what I'm going to do today is this is the, the first file on the download. Uh, at the top of the folder, if you do download these photographs, you're welcome to do so, um, and you know, take a look at them and and uh, take this away as a kind of a. I have changed one word on this page, but basically, when we're talking about photography, the things about photography, almost the whole story of photography, is about light and perspective, uh, the light that gives um, color balance, uh, directionality that creates maybe an object that you photograph the light in the photograph. Perspective, I've changed the word composition into perspective. And what I mean by that is not only the angle of lens, but the way if you look down or you look up or you come close, or you come far, but also how you look at the world, your perspective on what you want to photograph, how you choose to photograph that object. Do you want to celebrate the great white shark? Do you want to um, let people know and get educated about um, you know, the spawning of turtles? Uh, do you want to enlighten people or share your love and your passion for underwater photography? So perspective is a cool thing. And then the last word up there at the top is creativity. And that's huge because there's one thing about taking photographs where you basically say, here's the shark I saw, right? But making a photograph is an active engagement with the experience that you're having that you want to share with everybody else. And you want to do it in a way using these photographic techniques we're talking about at the bottom that makes it more interesting, that makes it unique and different, and that helps you win those contests that we just went through. And thank you so much for voting for my picture. It's fantastic always to get a first place in this group of photographers because it that is works. really um, you know, amazing. Why uh, am so I getting any audience? All right, unmute. I think someone's got their, their uh, mic on. So when we look at each one of the photographs I'm about to show you, I'm going to talk about these words and what they actually mean. The first column you see there is about the story. It's the virtuosity of you as a photographer learning your equipment so well that the equipment isn't part of the equation anymore getting your absolutely perfect balance and buoyancy underwater, working with the camera so many times that you just know where all the buttons and things are. If something isn't working, you know how to fix it quickly. If the exposure is not right, if the strobes don't go off, all these things, virtuosity means you spent your invested uh, 10,000 hours. Um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's kind of idea of how you become a master at anything 
right? And I agree with that. Um, so I've been shooting since I was uh, 15 years old with an underwater camera. Um, and I've been shooting for 50 years of my life as a professional photographer. And I've done every type of photography. So virtuosity is something that comes from you not having to think about your equipment while you're making a photograph. Um, and that also allows you to think about the next one, the decisive moment. At what moment, at what form, at what shape, at what time does your eye, your mind, and your heart align in one moment of your experience of life or the underwater environment to let you know it's time to press that shutter? Because we have some superpowers as underwater photographers. We can hold our breath for a long period. We can breathe underwater, right? That's a superpower. We can also stop time, which is photography. Uh, we can bring that back and share it with others. So those are the superpowers that you have. And what you decide to do with that power, to me, is all about giving it forward, uh, celebrating our environment, helping others to understand our environment different ways. You know, I've, I've been on shark dives where they fed the sharks, and I have like two opinions about that. But the one thing I know when I come back and I show people is that they realize you don't have to be afraid of them. You can celebrate them. You definitely don't want to kill them because you know they're endangered. So if I can spread that word so that other people love the environment the way I do and feel like you belong to the environment and you're part of it, um, I think that makes um, storytelling about the underwater world and sharing of photographs extra interesting. Gesture, and we'll talk about each of these and I'll kind of go through emotion, the rarity of the animal or the behavior or the environment, the humor, funny pictures, mystery, what is that, you know? That's the thing when I share my pictures on uh, Facebook, I have people constantly write, what the heck is that? I never knew that existed on the planet. That looks like an alien creature from another planet, right? Um, pleasure, just the fun and the beauty and the color and the vibrancy of the underwater world. Then we have a whole section of composition. So things like how you place stuff within the environment. So I'm gonna compare right now um, the letters that you have in the English alphabet. And when Shakespeare uses those letters, he composes them into words and then to paragraphs and then to books, novels, sonnets, et cetera. And that's composition. So you take the environment that you have. And one of the hard things about being a photographer is there's so many things that you have a choice of, what you decide to put in the frame and what you leave outside of the frame and how you uh, arrange those things together um, within that space is the whole thing about photography. And when you get to that point where all those things align and your brain says yes, and your heart starts pumping harder, that's the decisive moment that you decide to take that photograph. So I think talking about it helps you understand why one picture works over another. And it also can set up the pattern of thought to make more and more successful photographs time after time. Um, cropping, getting close, eliminating um, space in the background that's not necessary or might be distracting the photograph, creating depth of field with space, et cetera, negative space, meaning leave some space for the uh, heart to breathe and feel the scale of the things, leading lines and juxtaposition. So um, the book I'm working on basically is 100 photographs that I created in the last six years of diving um, that happens to coincide with my divorce, uh, where I all of a sudden went on this renaissance of rediscovering my underwater youth and started diving like crazy all of a sudden. Um, and then opposite of each photograph is going to be a story critiquing the photograph. And so it talks about what the lighting, composition, creating depth. So the layering of the foreground, the middle subject, the model to fill the frame gives me three different subjects that I'm photographed that right here are all aligned. So I'm going to be doing those using those words to describe each one of the photographs in the book. Then I'm going to go down and give you a little bonus information about, you know, how to work with an underwater model. You know, communicating underwater, uh, finding the position, clearing clear mask for good face shots, uh, making sure all your your straps and you know things are arranged. Your scuba kit is color coordinated. Uh, this actually happened to be Nicole's trip that we went on, and she was one of the models, and it was with the Goliath Groupers and one of the wrecks here. And then I found this gorgeous soft coral as a foreground element, and with the fisheye lens, it all kind of tied together and made what I think is one of my best photographs for the last seven years. 
Um, and then the story of the animal, the environment, so the Goliath grouper, they weigh up to 800 pounds. So the book is basically going to be all these things, including the location and some technical notes. So this is with a D500 nauticum housing. I'm sorry, nauticum. Did I say aquatica again? Nauticum housing, uh, two INON 230 strobes, Tequina, et cetera. ISO 800, uh, F8, 125th of a second, 40 feet of water. So all 100 photographs are going to basically get this treatment. The book's going to be about 225 pages. Um, and then, you know, here's a little, this is a handout as part of the download that you just uh, hopefully download and take a look at. Uh, make photographs. Don't take them. Don't bore me with your picture of there's a shark. Uh, I don't want to see that again, you know. There's so many images all over the planet. Make ones that stand out. And by using light, composition, creativity, and to talk about your pictures afterwards and think about your pictures in an analytical way, we can actually mathematically define what makes a great photograph and what makes a not so great photograph by using words that are appropriate to that idea. Uh, virtuosity, gesture, humor. Um, so here's some examples of pictures that will be in my book. And just to kind of give you uh, an idea of um, what I'm talking about when I use these words. So composition. In photography, you use all the above, but are, are different in that we must present and arrange all those thoughts in real time as they unfold before our eyes. So it's quite a trick to do this. You probably need a little bit more than 10,000 hours. You need at least a couple of hundred hours underwater to get used to your equipment, to pick out your kit, figure out what you're going to be working with, and all those other kind of ideas. Um, so I'm going to go through these, and you can see the words that are also on that um, uh, the, the image at the, at the bottom. So I'm going to talk about each one and give you an example of uh, how I would use and talk about uh, the images that way. Uh, light, the quality, direction, color, hardness or softness of light. Light sources can also be the subject of a photograph, as in this manta in Bali. Um, light can also be a subject for the photograph. And this is in Palau in the, uh, what I call the Cathedral of the Sea. This is where my religion is. This is where I live and I just kind of go wild, right? The direction, the quality of the hardness or softness of light. You can see at the top, there's some tuna schooling around. It's about 120 feet where this diver is looking up and just kind of being mesmerized. mesmerized. I look for peak experiences, um, things that make me feel like I'm humbled by belonging to this planet. And I want to protect it and I want to do things. Composition, the position, organization of subjects and objects in the frames, it's as important as what is in the frame as it is what's left out of the frame. So this composition goes into a swirling pattern and uses gesture as a way to express itself. It's also kind of fun. And of course, having that experience, I always feel like sometimes I can't possibly photograph how beautiful what I'm able to see is. But as you work harder and harder, towards that goal to be able to capture your experiences and to be keep them for yourself and share them with others, it's really a fun thing to do. So, you know, it's a night dive right off the Wakatobi Pier. It's about 10 feet of water. And I decide, oh, what a beautiful thing in the sun setting. So creativity is unique visual combination of elements and are subjects that are uniquely original form than other images, the opposite of a cliche. So, Take a picture that's different, that looks different. That's good to want, what's going to help you win competitions as well. Um, I love to listen to Alex Mustard talk about um, you know, the competition winners, and he talks about his own work and other people. He's got a great podcast going there that does exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, and he actually kind of inspired me in a lot of ways to, to continue to do this. And then the story. I mean, this is a story that you know people look at the picture and say, oh, my God. Uh, Time Magazine was going to use it on the cover. They paid $18,000 in a competition with Newsweek Magazine because there were no other phot photographs of Mel Fisher on the Atosha. I had the only one. And it's because I'd been working with him for years and visiting Key West constantly doing stories for the Herald about his search and everything else that I developed a relationship that I got to be that person that got to do that and actually find the first treasure chest, which will be forever, maybe on my tombstone, I don't know, but it's like today's the day, right? Um, virtuosity, so this is actually in Jenny Springs, and I did use a strobe 
Uh, no, I did not use a strobe in this instance. Um, I saw the same signs that Phil was alluding to. Again, when I grew up as a kid, I dove 76 different springs every weekend. We go to a different one, Rainbow River, um, before, when you could actually take your boat out there and scuba dive through the whole thing, Silver Springs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, Troy Springs with the sunken uh, Silver Ward Galleon. Um, so this is my roommate, and I've been working on a project called A Water Woman, which is a celebrate of, celebration of our environment and a celebration of women um, who I think are one and the same. They are the birth of our planet and of our people. Um, they are the source of inspiration for me, of love, adoration. Um, you know, just we need to celebrate our environment. And you find cultures that don't celebrate women also don't celebrate their environment. And they're more likely to dominate their environment and dominate their women rather than to celebrate and, and enjoy how beautiful both are in combination. And that feel like we belong to the planet rather than the planet belonging to us. Um, so that's my takeaway from my life's work as a photographer is to make you feel that you need to fall in love with it. So every photograph I'm looking to find love um, in the viewer's eyes to be the end of it. So expertly making an original photograph by use of the technical aesthetic creative instruments of photography, the performance of making a photograph, not taking one. Taking one is a snapshot, making a photograph, allows you and you must elevate the form of making the art of photography an art form truly. The decisive moment, this is in, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Mandalay Bay off the coast of Mexico. And uh, so they pulled the boat up and they have this big area and they toss some fish in there. So I'm hanging over the side with my full housing, no strobes, of course. Um, and I'm shooting at 500 of a second or so. And I shot 300 photographs, I think. No, I saw 1,000 photographs while they're diving for this. And this is the decisive moment, right? So Henry Cartier Brisson, uh, the creator of the idea of the decisive moment that belongs to all photography, is says, photography is the simultaneous recognition in a fraction of a second, the significance of an event, as well as of the precise organization of forms which give that event its proper expression. I could never say that better than he does. He wrote the book, The Decisive Moment, illustrated with his photographs, and he's one of the most celebrated. Uh, the beginning of Magnum photography was his um, invention with other people that uh, continue on the tradition of uh, the best photojournalism, the best photography in the world, and photographers. This invitation only clan of photographers that do the best work you've ever seen. Um, so some other things you want to think about is gesture. So I had 20 minutes with this young pup um, and I was away from the group of people diving in the Galapagos. And, um, and I was under a surf that was surging 20 feet forward and back within a second as the waves 10 or 15 foot tall were crashing on these very uh, coral encrusted rocks. It was a very dangerous situation, but this little animal just delighted me to, I, I have video of this, um, but gesture is the movement and pose of a body or object that expresses meaning, at times emotional, by its shape and position. So gesture is the movement of the fin in the direction of the, of the face and the fact that it's composed within these two peaks that you can see the surging water overhead. So you can feel what I felt when I was there, uh, this delight and playfulness of this animal that um, you know, makes this, to me, a really wonderful photograph. Gesture is what dancers use when they want to emote the feeling of sadness or gladness or celebration. They move their bodies into shapes and contort themselves the way objects can do the same thing. Emotion. So when I was in Wakatobi, one of the people there was a scientist at, whose expertise was turtles. This happens to be a Ridley turtle. And they had collected very rare that they ever had turtles laying eggs on the beach. So they brought the, um, the turtle eggs in for incubation to make sure they got to a good ripe age. And, but they waited for like 10 months. They had them in a tank. And the, the scientist got there and says, oh, no, 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 you can't do this. You've got to release them to the wild. So while I was there, um, we got to release them into the wild and see them, you know, I think it was about 10 months old at this point. And uh, it was an emotional experience. Um, this is right off the pier. If you've ever been to Wakatobi, it's a fabulous place to go. 
right off the pier, we took them out in buckets and we released them out. And of course they go for the sand instead of the big open ocean. Ridleys are um, unique in their depth they go to in the ocean. And there is a nice deep area right off the coast of the, the main island of Wakatobi uh, that we got to um, release them. So when a photo makes you feel happiness, sadness, pity, shock, or emotion, uh, it can be successful because it taps into human things that we all can relate to. Rare and unusual. So I'm just, you know, going along in Bali, and all of a sudden, I see this. And I wasn't sure. I'd look for a while, and I'm like, wait, is that fish alive or dead? The fish was indeed dead, and I think there was a struggle before I got there that also happened. But I just thought it was so weird. So it wasn't moving. It was just stuck in this position. So it was a very easy shot to make. Um, the only thing I wish I had done is used a lower ISO. I think it's a little bit grainy on the screen here. But, but yeah, it's a very different picture. So unusual. You don't get to see um, eating behaviors and things like that. So when you find an original uh, rare animal, an unusual behavior like this, uh, that's not been photographed that I've seen before, like this in particular, um, in an environment that's unusual, maybe it's worth thinking about taking a picture, right? Um, humor. Um, you've got no audio? Is anybody else missing audio? No, I can hear you fine. Okay. You're doing great, Rick. All right, thank you. Uh, humor. So, uh, I'm sitting in Socorro at the um, Roca Partida, and uh, these uh, originally we got there, there's a pod of dolphins sitting there, and they're in a vertical position, and two of them started to mate right in front of me, so I got that picture, and that was kind of interesting, unique, and then I realized they were mating, but they're also being cleaned, so they're in the vertical position, like six of them in a row. Then they all went off, and they came, and then I see this guy, the one at the top, he literally, I video this, right, to prove it, 40 feet away from me. He looks at me. He then gathers his friends. He comes right over. And the very moment I took the picture, he decides to poop in front of me. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. Uh, the weird thing is I've gotten three pictures exactly like this. This is my favorite, though, because I saw this guy. You can see the markings um, from mating rituals on his back and top here. Um, you can see the whole pod and you can see the poop coming out. So it's kind of a fun picture. So it, it makes you chuckle. You just kind of laugh, whatever. Um, humor is definitely the reason why the first three Star Wars movies were wonderful, right? Um, and if they'd done that with the other ones, they probably would have been even better. I think humor is so important. Also very difficult to photograph because you got to have a sense of humor to think that a dolphin pooping and coming your way with his friends to do so is funny. Um, you know, I do anyway. So night dive at Cocoa View, actually, we we're talking about Cocoa View earlier, a night dive, this 10 foot wide basket star, uh, there's the base of it there. Um, uh, mystery is a, a photo that challenges you to wonder, what are you looking at, an abstract, or it leaves you questioning what it is or what it means, right? In this case, the basket star, as we shown the lights, all of a sudden, the animals got attracted, and then the basket started to close up piece by piece. Um, as this one right here, you can see there's also leading lines going across the composition. There's a crash point over here um, in the photograph. And then this one piece up at the top is where it's starting to close up. Within 10 minutes, the entire basket was no bigger than a basketball. And its full extension was 10 foot wide. Um, so yeah, photograph the stuff that people have never seen before, or they don't know what that is, and you'll have an interesting conversation in finding out about it. Pleasure. I mean, this is a carpet worm, right? Um, uh, Persian carpet worm, if I'm not mistaken. Someone, I do need some help with it, uh, photo IDs on um, some of the animals in some of my photographs. If anybody wants to volunteer to work with me as I finish off this book, I'd love that. Um, I know Susan Mondolian's helped me edit down from what was 250 pictures to 100. Um, and that's been spectacularly wonderful that she did that um, and gave me really good reasons to why and actually taught me a few things. The visceral pleasure and the visual eye candy and sensuality expressed subtly or explicitly by a subject. This thing was undulating like the dance of the seven veils uh, as it appeared in front of me. Um, there were hundreds of photographs taken. This one is the one I feel really expresses the gesture and the movement of the animal as it undulated in front of me. 
Um, so in a still photograph, it still has the movement that I would have captured in video perhaps. And I think sometimes the decisive moment is much better, almost always for me, much better than, um, than that. Composition, foreground, background. Um, you could talk about the rule of thirds, for example. Um, and it's a tic-tac-toe board. And then you want the subjects to be at those points of intersection. The idea is when you read a book, you start in the top left, you go to the right, you go down in a Z pattern when you read. If you have things out of the center, your eye starts to naturally move and navigate across the frame in this pattern, because that's what you're used to. If you place objects in action in those action pattern points, uh, your composition might be improved or made even more dramatic. Um, there's also the idea of composition framing. So framing a subject like this fish within the coral that's surrounding it gives a contextual environment that your subject appears within, gives it an idea of where this animal lives, what its experience of life is like, the little fish in the foreground are not really distracting because they add to the story you're trying to tell. So composition and framing is really everything, right? Sometimes you want a minimalist approach. You just want the animal itself. You want to get closer, you want to use a longer lens, um, and you want to fill the frame to get rid of anything unnecessary. Um, you know, in the camouflage pictures I was noticing, it's kind of difficult to get uh, close-up pictures of small animals if they're camouflaged kind of animals. Um, so you have to do some things like maybe snoot or do some other things to kind of isolate the subject. And I think that's why uh, Tom's pictures with the snoot are really spectacular. I've got to get him to teach me how to use those things. Um, but yeah, you can eliminate and crop and you can get closer. Um, you can use a snoot. You can do things like that too. Um, intensify the subject matter and eliminate anything that distracts you. The whole idea of being minimalist in your camera making um, can be a thing you do. A sense of depth, like this giant cave in, um, I think this was, oh, this was a Coco, Cocos um, in um, Costa Rica. So the cave's huge, 110 feet or 20 feet at the bottom, and you've got this sense of depth created by the layers and the diminishing contrast, foreground person shooting video and the background people way in the distance. It's also a nice version of um, scale and size. So the comparison of the large and the small divers gives you an idea of how big this cave is. Um, the composition of the three forms forms a triangle. Um, again, something um, kind of worthwhile. Negative space, um, let the animal inhabit their environment and display that. So if you take a picture of a close-up of a turtle, there's been billions made, right? Um, where do they live and what's in their environment? Well, this gives you a little bit more of that negative space, uh, which graphic designers use quite a lot. It gives meaning, gives contrast, it gets a context for the environment, um, gives the idea that things are immense and big, perhaps, right? Um, leading lines, like you saw in the earlier photograph, the lines going down to this crash point to the right, sets up a nice composition. And the two subjects really going on in here are this little piece and then the big ball at the bottom, right? So a seascape, yeah, that's actually really nice. I like that idea, uh, uh, saying it that way. Um, why is it going forward? Juxtaposition. So the effect of objects placed next to each other in the frame, creating a third meeting. So this is in Cocos also, and we're watching parade of hammerheads go back and forth. They come a little bit closer to get cleaned. But well, just in the distance, in fact, I didn't even realize this was a photograph until I put some pictures I gave them to the, uh, the sea hunter group that I was with, diving with, and I said, you can use these freely and um, discredit me. And, um, you know, I want to go on the next trip and get a discount. And that's what I've been doing <laughs> quite a bit is kind of volunteering my work to help them out. And they help me out anyway. Um, so they said, oh, this is their favorite photograph. And I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't even see the whale shark when I took the photograph. And it wasn't until I did a second edit that I even see it back there. Now, you've got the environment. You've got that negative space with a billion fish, which is what it was really like. The visibility wasn't fantastic. It was probably 50 feet. It's not bad, but not great. And that whale shark came out of nowhere. And I didn't even have a photograph. I didn't think there was a photograph there to be had. Um, but there it is. But that combination of a hammerhead next to a whale shark in an environment like this 
is the juxtaposition of different ideas, different subjects that kind of come together. You know, um, uh, that's an interesting question. Why is the camera seeing more than the eye? Um, because you haven't trained yourself uh, to really be, uh, actually, let me, let me start over. Uh, many people have asked me, um, uh, when you go on vacation, you take your camera with you, you're constantly shooting photographs. Um, don't you miss out on a lot of things? I say, no, just the opposite. I am an active participant in looking for unique, incredible moments to happen in front of me. All I'm doing is documenting my active search for the incredible, the creative, the um, composition, the, the light. Um, I can go somewhere and enjoy just the light. I can sit there at a cafe and just watch the lights change as the city goes into darkness in Paris. And I can find beauty in those things. Perhaps the most um, important thing that I've gained over time is the ability to find something. So here's an assignment I give my students. They have to go from a parking garage on the seventh floor downtown to the classroom on the fifth floor. And in that process, um, I say, uh, do you like that experience? I say, no, I hate that experience. It's horrible. Elevators never work. There's all kinds of dirt and trash. And today it rained and blah, blah, blah. And then I said, let's go out with our cameras. And I want you to find photographs. I go out with my iPhone. They've got their cameras that they've just learned how to use. And they come back and they have like maybe one or two pictures because now they've activated the fact that they're, they're looking, right? The camera actually gives you permission to actively seek things that are maybe insignificant to other people, but to find the beauty in the insignificant. I think that's a life lesson for me, that I find beauty in the smallest things that everybody else overlooks. Not just to make photographs, but I mean that in a metaphysical statement as well. Um, I notice things. I experience everything that I've ever done in my life. And um, I'm looking so intently to find what is the ultimate expression of that, that decisive moment. Um, and I want to share it, that I actually feel more deeply. I get emotional when I dive. When I see, saw a pregnant whale shark and I saw the scientist on board doing a sonogram, I cried because it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, other than my daughter and son being born and some other things. But, you know, it's like, oh, my God, wow. Um, but so I take my pictures and then I show my students what I photograph and I'll come back with five or six outstanding photographs. There's a, where did you see that? Where did you see that? And the same thing after dive. That's my favorite thing to hear when I show a slideshow at the end of the evening or something when I'm dive boat, where was that, you know? And that's the thing, make yourself an active participant in the looking for um, decisive moments or epic experiences, really. That's it. You're looking for the epic experience of a lifetime. Um, obviously diving with Mel Fisher is an epic experience of a lifetime for me, but so is diving with a whale shark and seeing a woman swimming as fast as it is at 85 feet of water going down 120 and getting an actual um, sonogram of the pregnant whale shark. Um, yeah, the prescience of your perspective. Yeah, exactly. I think that's it. And you have superpowers to be able to breathe underwater, to be able to float and fly with whale sharks. You have the superpower also to stop time and bring that moment, that ultimate prescient experience back to share with others. So that's why I make photographs. Um, and that's kind of what I have to share, I think. Um, I wanna get everybody excited about this. So I'm constantly doing these kind of uh, presentations because I want everybody to care and give a damn about the sharks. I want people to care and give a damn about our environment and about women and about each other and, you know, having the respect for each other to wear a mask and not go anywhere near someone, get vaccinated. All these things have to do with this core value that you have as a human being. What can I do for the greater good of humanity? What can I share? What can I give? And that's why I'm going to be a lifelong teacher. And I found my passion in life. And I hope it's a little bit contagious. So thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to offer, yeah, stop making me cry. I know, Tom, right? Uh, yeah, today I had my students, I had two classes today. I uh, had them crying six times during that, <laughs> the one day. 
I'm in a really kind of a deep, dark place because I had COVID over Christmas holiday, wasn't able to spend it with my family. I got into a, a really deep funk. And I think it's not wearing off, but what I'm taking away from it, because I'm always looking for the opportunity to make something positive out of everything I experience, um, yeah. Yeah, is to go out and uh, find a way to make something positive out of it. And that's what this is. You need to feel emotions so you know what you don't have right now, that you don't have that freedom. The being locked up for two years, hell, nobody wants that, right? So when I went back in the classroom in person and I saw the people I've been talking to with just their name on a Zoom call, I you know, almost cried just walking in the room because this is like, this is so beautiful. It's humanity. It's people. This is what I, you know, I'm interacting and, and making them cry was actually kind of fun because it's like, oh my God, I get to cry with other people. I get to share, you know? So uh, yeah, that's kind of cool. And thank you so much. Um, one the opportunity I'd like to uh, offer if I still have some time, Chris, I'm not sure how we're doing on time. We're, we're doing great. It's 8.48. Okay. Yeah. And what time do I need to finish up? Well, you have as long as you want, but we're trying, we've uh, blacked off about an hour. So another 10 or 12 minutes or so would be fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, the pictures that I put on the download, does anybody want to talk about their favorite photograph? So what you can do is look in that 100 folder and find the picture that you like. Let's say it's uh, number five here, Bimini, right? And I'll bring it up on screen and then I'll let you talk about the uh, how you would describe it. What the words I'd like you to think about in the process is light, composition, creativity, storytelling, and those are the words for storytelling, and composition. If you go and you search for your best hundred photographs of all time, you'll be able to analyze using these words why they work. Um, so that's just kind of like, I'll offer that up. Does anybody want to volunteer to do so? Number 90, thank you. I actually do this in my class uh, as well. So, and then if you would come on with your audio. So uh, this is in Cocoa View, actually. It uh, actually okay. tells you. No, which, that's not the one I meant then, sorry. Uh, okay, which one is it? Uh, it's a spotted eagle ray. It says 90 Cocoa Island. Oh, Cocos Island. Okay. Cocos Island. Nope. 97? No, not that one. Uh, this one? Oh, there's it. That's it? Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think? Why do you like it? Well, I like it. Uh, it, it engages the eye, I think, you know, in terms of composition. Um, you're kind of on the left side of the frame, moving towards the right side of the frame. I think it, it fills the frame. It's kind of peak, peak of the moment action. You know, the, you can tell that the Eagle Ray is just coming in there um, with its tail up. Uh, I know a little bit about Eagle Rays, so I can see that nice little um, uh, spine there on the, mm -hmm. on the end. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a really nice shot and I like the, you know, I just like it. Yeah. So it was coming right up at me and grazing on the, the coral in front of me. It actually took a little bite out of my fin or tried to anyway. So that's kind of fun. Yeah. I think exactly what you're saying, that sort of triangular formation of the wings and then the crash point, that's a way of talking about the eyeball being at that intersection of those leading lines moving down to that space. Um, nothing unnecessary is in the frame. You want to see the environment. You want to see the movement of the sand here in the photograph. You want to see, um, you know, nice blue background that's kind of completes the whole scenario. So I had thousands of pictures of this. They were in every dive that we made pretty much kind of eating away at our, um, at our feet and fins and that kind of thing. So thanks. That's perfect. That's exactly what I want. Okay. Number six, I'm getting a request for, I just realized some of these are, um, couple of them are not going to be in the book. I did some last minute editing um, and I'm about uh, three quarters of the way or halfway through the book. Um, but I definitely would love your, if anybody wants to send me a, a written um, thing here, uh, that would be a great idea. Oh, crash point, Tom. Crash point means that um, there's something leading to a focal point. Um, that, so the two wings of that, e, that ray basically led down to the eyeball. That crash point is the place where your eyeball stops at the end of it. Okay, so who liked this picture, Chris? Yes, um, I, 
particularly with sharks, um, I like black and white. Um, there's, and in this particular image as well, there's, it's got a lot of the elements you talk about. If you consider the sun rays um, as the leading lines to the main attraction, um, and then the positioning of the classic hammer head of the hammer um, in the lower third of the rule of thirds. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, rather than, and I don't know what the opposite of, ne of negative space is, but in this case, you eliminated the negative space by bringing it into the foreground and it's simplistic in its minimalism. Um, and there's nothing complicated about it. Um, you know, I would have, it would have been interesting to explore what you might have done with the sun rays um, in Lightroom as well, which might even add greater contrast. But again, I'm not sure how old that photo is. Um, but it's, you know, it's, as you've described, it's, it's got the classic elements of lines and rule of thirds, but also simplicity. Um, and I think by doing it in black and white, it, it sort of, it, it, it maintains that simplicity. Yeah, that, uh, the black and white idea is actually really interesting. And I talk about it in the book, but uh, when I'm in an environment where the, basically everything is just so blue, it's monochromatic. I decide to go to black and white because it adds a lot more drama. This photograph in particular, I went back, uh, I've always used it as a black and white photograph, I think it's beautiful, but I've decided to put it in color and it's actually quite spectacular in color. I don't have that example in here to show you all, but uh, definitely will be in color in my book. But that's kind of a thing that I always, if you got muddy green water, yeah, sometimes you'd want to go with the black and white, like the, the whale shark and the hammerhead, right? Um, that was a horrible picture in color. But in black and white, you got to the essential environment. Getting rid of color gets rid of sometimes the distraction of the shape and form that really are the subject we're talking about. So the leading lines of the light, the negative space of that light space, and the positive object within that negative space. Um, yeah, I think it does that simplicity thing. Stuff outside of the frame. So this is actually with a dive with Tom Poff. And actually, at the end of the dive, we each pointed at each other frequently underwater. And we were like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I pointed at Tom. And then I uh, get on Facebook that night. Behind Tom was a shark coming right at him. And I took a picture and I posted it on Facebook. Right behind me was also a photograph by Tom that he posted of me being almost attacked by a hammerhead right behind him. But we didn't see that till we both got home and, and, and did that. I don't know if Tom remembers that experience. It was pretty spectacular. Um, yeah, this was a shark feeding in incident. Yeah, he remembers that pretty funny. Yeah, cool. Okay, so that's number six. Then we have 51 Armory. 51. Yeah, I think it, um, oh yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so what do you think? Mr. Cruz? Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. There you go. Sorry, I was I was muted. No worries. Yes, uh, there is a, a way to look at uh, groupings of photographs under the concept of gestalt perception, uh -huh. which includes uh, similarity, proximity, closure, and continuity. Oh, and yeah. I think that this, this one is a perfect example of the uh, proximity, where you have two uh, elements that uh, influence one another. Mm -hmm. And uh, it uses not only the colors and the framing, uh, but also uh, elements within it that are intriguing. Uh, something that looks like uh, a necklace. I don't even know if it is a necklace that you place there. Is it? No, it is not. That's an animal. That, is, an animal. Animal. that is unbelievable. Yeah, it, it kind of shocked me as well. It's a sponge. And this looks like a treasure chest to me of like, you know, gold beads falling into other coins at the bottom kind of thing. Uh, it's a very, yeah, Johnny Depp kind of feeling moment for me. When I took the picture, I got back and I started looking at it. I did some adjusting of it. Uh, Susan Mendolian commented that the colors are a little bit off still. I'm going to work on that before I print the book. But, but yeah, I think it has this juxtaposition of elements. 
And I love that you use all the Gestalt principles and you just describe this photograph in Gestalt ways. It's a, a psychological way to think about how we see, which is the foundation of all those ideas of composition, et cetera, proximity and things like that, connectivity and a negative space, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else got a choice they'd like to make? I see 45. Ingrid, would you like to talk about that photograph? Looking at it. There's so many beautiful photographs, I've got to say. They just, but this one. So you see how you've got the shadow underneath him, you've got the red on one side, and then you've got this, I think, what is it, a sponge behind him? And just the animal is just gorgeous. So I don't, I mean, I'm not a photographer, I'm a musician, but <laughs> I am a diver, but I just love it. I just love it. It's got all the color. I would never have seen, it's really small animal, I mean, it's really little, I would imagine. Yeah, it's about three inches or so. Yeah. So yeah. the colors, is, right? Uh, I'm saying, say again? All, all the colors, right? So you got all these, it's just beautifully placed. I mean, I'm not a photographer, but it looks great. Really yeah, so it's a mandarin fish, and it was on the Pelagian, the ship that belongs to Wakatobi. And I was lucky enough to be on there with only four people, or three people, divers on board. Uh, it was an amazing, the whole group canceled, and I got to go with two other people. Um, anyway, so this is underneath the pier, underneath the boat, in basically a concrete background environment. And at every single night, <laughs> they have sex. Uh, so four males, three or four males will vie for the attention of the female. They actually fight, so like biting each other's neck, et cetera. I did photograph that as well. This is the female um, at the end that was going up to, um, uh, you know, up to the surface. And um, uh, so it just presented itself in a very simple way. The colors, the patterns, the textures just was enough to make a spectacular, fun photograph. Um, and also, I love that idea that non-divers um, or non-photographers will get to see an animal that they know nothing about. And to get to hear the story about here, I'm sitting underneath literally a ship over my head that was, you know, docked on a dock, mm -hmm. concrete pilings, and there was junk strewn everywhere on the ground. And then every night, about, a, you know, two dozen of these animals get together, they fight over the females, they go up to the surface, and then they mate with the one victor of the, the group. And then the next night it happens again, right as the sun is setting. It's a bizarre experience. And that was one of the few places you can definitely see it. Also in Palau, there's a couple of places, actually at the bar, at the dive shop in Palau, right over where you're drinking your beer, there's a dozen that live there all the time. Wow. Uh, yeah, and saying that uh, the best Mandarin dive that she's ever made. Uh, I would agree. It was a, a, an extraordinary experience. And again, it's one of those peak epic experiences that very few people get a chance to go do. And imagine how much it cost in my time and my effort to go do this. And I get to come back with this. What a joy, right? If I'm going to spend the treasure of my life's time, this is what I want to do. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, 87 or 79. I'm sorry, Lauren asked for 79. And I love hearing what you guys have to say. In fact, if you don't get a chance to talk tonight, just send me an email. It's uh, rickmccauley at gmail.com and make your comments. Just tell me which picture you're talking about because I'd like to add your thoughts to uh, how you look at things is different than how do I look at it. As a viewer, um, you don't have, you have the objectivity of not realizing how long it took me to make a photograph or all the other things that get in the way of me purposefully picking my best photographs. I try, have tried, that's why I had strangers do it, uh, or friends do it, um, to help me pick better because your reaction and your experience of this is different than my physical experience of having been there that sometimes adds more value than it's worth. So thank you for that. Okay, so uh, Lauren, yes, please. Uh, this, I like, they keep you you talk about different rules of photography there's rule of thirds and all these other ones i don't know the names but this is one as well where um, you have a leading line it comes from maybe in this case the upper right hand corner and it actually curls so it automatically draws your attention and creates a focal point in the middle just because of 
of thank you, Fibonacci. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is the blurred background. It's, I just like it. I like, because it's maybe because one of the photography principles, but just how perfectly executed it is where the, the original subject comes in from the upper right-hand corner and does the swirl and centers at the focal point. Perfectly said, exactly that, right? It's uh, also cool looking, look at the textures and all the, so this is the picture after that photograph you saw early of the same basket star in Coco View. Um, so it's right off, it's, it's swimming distance from the Coco View establishment itself. You go down a little trail and then you're on the, the shipwreck. It's off to the left of the shipwreck um, that's there, uh, Prince Albert. Um, and a night dive is, is a spectacular thing to do there because it's perfectly calm. It's isolated. No matter what's going on the rest of the island, it, that whole place is just uh, shore diveable, uh, like spectacular. I think it's probably the best shore dive in the world. Uh, Wakatobi is a close first and second combination. But yeah, as far as having a shipwreck there, night diving, stuff like this, uh, the animals, the wildlife, and the protected area that you're diving in, Coco View is really spectacular for that. So as uh, other animals came up, as my video lights were attracting more animals, it started collapsing on and feeding on the animals that were there. But I was looking for that shape to appear. And I was just fortunate enough to make that that photograph at that time. So yeah, but it's a constantly waiting and watching and you know, it's logistics. Underwater photography is enormous logistics to get you to the place at the time where something's gonna happen. So yeah, that's very well said, thank you. And then we have 87. I think we've got time for maybe one or two more. 87, call me, tell me know if this is 87. Oh, here we go. This is actually one of my new favorite photographs of all time. Well, let's let hear what you have to say about it. Well, I think it's one of the most creative shot of schooling fish that I've seen. <laughs> and for me, it's like almost like a sculpture. It's like the texture of it that I really like. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of those fresk, you know, like on, on in cement, like on, oh, yeah. Yeah. On, on buildings. Okay. So really interesting. Yeah, I, you know, I had this, it, this creeped me out. I was underwater, like fearing for my life because they all looked at me at once. Uh, like I call it, you know, uh, the hung jury, right? It is a bit creepy. It, it is. I mean, it, but, you know, like, so I always try to figure out my photographs. What's the logic of why I'm feeling this way? And um, so the experience of this was as creepy as this photograph is. But at the same time, it's this sort of juxtaposition. My favorite is these two fish right here that, Form, form a perfect human face with a smile below it, if you kind of look at them collectively together, and then every other fish is looking right at me. I mean, just feel like I'm guilty as charged, you know? What have I done to kill you? You know, I, I never fish or do anything. I really, I like you guys. It would make a cool puzzle, it would, yeah, that would be fun. I'm always, if anybody knows of a good puzzle company, I'd love to do some underwater pictures of puzzles. Um, my family usually does that for Christmas every year, and it's kind of fun. Yeah, thanks for that, appreciate it. Okay, well done. We got time for one more, or are we good? Let's do one more. Okay. Who's got a number they want to call out? Anybody? Chris, do you want to pick one? <laughs> well, I'm screen recording, so I don't want to uh, affect my recording. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Otherwise, right. I would. 88. All right. Uh, also in Galapagos. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. What do you think? I just like the colors. I, I love seahorses. So um, I'm drawn to it because of the seahorse. You use the rule of thirds. And I just love the the uh, contrast in colors. Yeah, it's kind of uh, a combination of lines and colors. Okay, cool. Yeah, so like when you're putting together a painting, you use complementary colors and you think about those kind of things. A couple of things that I think are interesting about this, in Galapagos, the last thing on earth I expected to find was a seahorse. Um, I've been looking at Cocoa View, I, I found tons of them. In fact, I have too many. But in all of the 10 different uh, seahorses that I found in Cocoa View, none of them had this color combination sitting on a sponge 
with a background like this and this golden color and an eyeball and then just the pose and everything kind of came together. Um, so it's, you know, 50, 60 photographs and you end up finding one that's the best. And that's what I hope, um, you know, we use the word rule of, you know, kind of thing in composition. I would suggest they're only suggestions. And all they really do is help you understand why maybe this picture looks so simple because it aligns to how you see things, how you read a book, right? So it belongs to your natural way of looking at things. And then it satisfies something inside of you of beauty and color and pleasure of looking at the textures of the colors juxtaposed with each other. So the words juxtaposition and color and contrast and uh, rule of thirds and all those things, it's just a way to talk about photography so that when you can understand how humans see things and how we feel things that we see, um, you can design and think about how you're gonna make your next photograph. And then you're gonna be able to say, this is better than that. And also tell me why. So that's the whole point of this is um, that we wanna have a conversation about our photographs to help us understand how we made these photographs, my favorite 100 of all time of the last you know, seven years um, in my case, um, why are they? Um, and it's not about just the experience I've had that got me to make the photograph. It has to be for me valid in the eye of any viewer that sees it. If I show you a picture of my daughter, she's beautiful, um, but the pictures of her mean something entirely different to me than it does to you. Um, if I show you pictures of my family vacation, yeah, you know, it's, it's going to mean something different to you. But if I show you a photograph that you care about, um, that makes you feel, um, then I've done something. I've elevated myself and my way of seeing to an art form. Um, and I think that's the point. Live artfully, live fully, experience life intensely. Um, you know, don't leave the planet without the absolute biggest smile on your face because you've just done what you came here to do. You know, so... I think COVID has been an existential thing for a lot of us. Uh, no more, no, I, you know, for me, it's been completely that. Um, I realized what I had and what I miss, what I care about, what I love, uh, and the people that are all those things to me and the environment that means all those things to me. Um, and if you can live your life so fully as that, that uh, people celebrate you or want to see what you're doing next or just want to be around you, Surround yourself with the like-minded people and you're just going to have a happy life and pay it forward and give it forward and spread the word. You know, this is like love to me, man. I just want to give it to everybody. And it always comes back. So thank you so much for having me here as a presenter today. It's been my pleasure. And thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Rick. Um, I, uh, four words come to mind uh, after, you know, being on this call. Number one, I felt truly fortunate to have been uh, on this call and witness what you've just uh, done for us. Um, I feel honored to have you here and uh, to have you prepare this presentation for us. I feel very inspired uh, at these pictures that I've seen, um, the places you've gone, the quality of the photos, what, what I've learned today. And finally, more than anything, I feel humbled. Uh, the pictures that I've seen are just breathtaking. Um, whatever I, you know, whatever pictures I thought that I've got that were great, uh, they're not in the same universe as some of these things that you, these pictures that you've taken. So, oh, you're too kind. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, it's been my absolute pleasure. And I'll return the screen over to you guys. Um, let's see, how do I stop sharing? Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, it's been uh, absolute delight. Thank you so much. Uh, this is what I live for sharing with you guys. I've learned so much. I know so many of you been diving with a lot of you. I want to dive with more of you. Um, and I'd love to offer this to any time that uh, somebody wants to have critiques, uh, call me up, we'll do a Zoom call. I'm gonna start doing uh, monthly uh, kind of Zoom calls where we talk about ideas about photography in general, not just underwater photography. Um, I'm gonna start up the, uh, the, um, uh, the Miami photography um, group that I used to run about five years ago. And it's just all photography, it has nothing to do mostly with underwater. 
Uh, but we'll do monthly meetings. I'll let you guys know if you want to participate in that. Or if you want to reach out, you've got my email information. Feel free to do that. Um, it's been a pleasure being part of the club for almost 35 years, really, if you think about it. Um, and I've learned so much. And I, I just love uh, you know, the, the pleasure to be able to present to you all. Thank you so much. Great presentation.